And so welcome back to the European Parliament in Strasbourg for the second part of Talking Europe. Let me introduce you to my guest today, Daniel Cohn-Bendit, known across Europe as the charismatic leader of the May 68 student protest in Paris. The young Danny the Red has long changed his political colouring into Danny the Green and Danny the Blue as the co-president of the group of the Greens here in the European Parliament. Daniel cohn is a federalist. He believes the solutions to the current crisis lie in more Europe, not less Europe, as some have suggested. Daniel cohn it's a pleasure to have you on our programme, uh, Talking Europe. We're in Strasbourg this week because you've just attended the plenary session. Now, there was a vote in the Assembly. Three quarters of MEPs want a treaty change. They want a single seat for their parliament. Many in France feel that what they really want is to stay in Brussels. Was this vote an attack against Strasbourg, a rebellion against the role of France in Europe? Not about the role of France. It is a lot of... Uh... MPs think it would be better with one seat in Brussels. But it was a completely useless vote. It is you abstain, by the way. Yeah, I abstain because it's a, a intellectual parliamentary masturbation, you know, because it is in the treaty, and the treaty to change it is unanimity. So, or you propose something real, an alternative for Strasbourg for, for, to France, to say you make a European university, uh, a university where... Uh, Strasbourg could become the scientific centre, one of the of Europe of scientific exchange in all the level. You know, then it would be something where Strasbourg could think about all the months a university, twenty thousand students, professors every two years changing. This is an economic added value for Strasbourg. If not, France would move, and it won't move, and it will stay. So this parliamentary should do. Uh, earnest and important legislative vote, and now such a, a vote will mean nothing. It's why I abstain. But do you agree that these endless shuttles between Brussels and Strasbourg are costing a lot of money and are logistically too heavy? And as a Green, you must be worried yes, about the I, pollution. Yes, I agree. I, I said I defended the idea that we have to uh, change it in two elections in France. It's not my problem. Mm -hmm. But then propose something. Only voting without a proposition, you know that you won't was do it. Was it a populist vote? Why do I... It was... Uh, I don't know. It was a vote that the, the MP said we want to stay in, in, in Strasbourg. In Brussels, OK, OK. But it was a useless. It was a useless... I, I underline it, a useless vote. Now, another important vote this week, after months of political wrangling, MEPs adopted uh, the next budget for the European Union for the next seven years, actually. Well, uh, this programme is produced in partnership with uh, Associates, France's leading business school. Uh, the president of Associates, uh, European think tank, Noël Lenoir, has a question for you. Let's listen to her. Mr Deputy, you have expressed your anger regarding the reduction of the EU budget, the first in Europe's history. And uh, you have rightly criticised the rising selfishness of so many member states. But I think that, to a certain extent, you have missed the point. You have underestimated the role of the EU Parliament, which has obtained certain concessions. First, an additional payment of 11 billion euros for the current budget. Second, more flexibility to revise the budget when the circumstances are better. And third, the possibility also to transfer taxes to boost the independence of the EU institutions. So here is my question. Don't you think that in underestimating the role of the EU Parliament, you risk dissuading the electorate to vote to the next EU elections? Daniel Kuhn-Bendig, you, you called the decision of your fellow uh, lawmakers to adopt the budget uh, sadomasochistic. But as Noël Lenoir puts it, aren't you missing the point? Aren't you actually fueling Euroscepticism when you say that this assembly is too weak? No, well, uh, did you attend the debate? It was uh, really incredible. All the political party, from the centre-right to the centre-left, to I don't know why, said it's a bad 
bad budget proposition, but there is no alternative. If in democracy someone says there is no alternative, I stop to go to parliament because then I don't have to discuss. You know, there was an alternative. The problem is that uh, the British Conservatives were right. We are here nine months after the beginning of this debate, exactly where Camerons want to be. So David Cameron, the strongest advocate of budget reductions, has is won the winner. battle. Is a winner. Is a winner of this. Is the winner of this. You know, and and I think that it's a structurally a conservative backwards-oriented budget. You're not a big fan of David Cameron, are you? No, I'm not. I'm not. I think Cameron doesn't understand Europe. You know, I, it's not his fault because it's intellectually. He doesn't get the point. You know, Does the he po want to demolish Europe? No, he wants Europe only as a free market. But Europe is not a free market. Europe is also a political entity where we must be able to help the weak in Europe, we must be able to launch an ecological transition, an energetic transition. We must able, you know, to boost the economy. And this budget is not doing it. National budget are in austerity. So the only possibility to boost it, you know, if you invest 10 billion in the European Investment Bank, yeah, it gives you, because you have uh, leverage, leverage you, it gives you 100 billions to invest in European economy. So I said, we missed the point in the parliament to show how effective this parliamentary representation could be. And in the election, we have to fight to elect people who are really wishing you know, to boost European democracy by using the tools of the European parliament. Talking about the next European elections that will take place uh, in May, um, you saw the latest polls, like I did. Um, populist anti-European parties and far-right parties are poised to make big gains in France. Uh, Marine Le Pen uh, is expected to come ahead of all other parties. Who is to blame for this? dramatic rise in far-right parties. Well, to blame, to blame are we, are we all, because we can't demonstrate the added value of Europe. The problem is, if you want to regulate globalization, you need Europe. In 30 years, none of the European country, none of the European country will be member of the G8. Or our sovereignty nationally don't exist. The market boosted away the national sovereignty. So, if you want to regain sovereignty, we need a strong Europe. So the position of the populist going back to the national state is the position of weakening the people. This we have to defend, this we have to explain, and then we can win this election. But you must understand, explain to the people why they need to fight the financial crisis, ecological crisis, and economic crisis, they need a stronger, a better Europe. Marine Le Pen hopes to form a large group in the parliament with other parties from the Netherlands, from Austria, from Belgium. Is European democracy in danger? No, this is democracy. They exist politically. I don't like them, but they exist. You know, I'm like Voltaire. I will fight for their right to exist because this is the, the base of democracy. But we have to defend our... My problem is not Marine Le Pen. My problem is to get the people to understand that I can explain that I'm intelligent. I'm not me personally, but the people who defend Europe, the, the green, European green, that they have a real, real boosting to explain why we think that to solve the problem that we have, we need this strong, a stronger Europe. Now, in France, the uh, justice minister, Christiane Taubira, was the target of racist attacks. Uh, she was even compared to a monkey because of the colour of her skin. What's going on in France? Well, I think uh, French society is in a bad shape. And it's uh, French society, you know, the people are afraid. And in this situation, populists, you know, try to be clean uh, when they talk publicly. But in reality, you know, they push this racism, anti-Semitism. They push, you know, the, the hate the other. This is also, in a moment of crisis, this, this uh, uh, thought of things emerge, you know. And uh, we, have to, we have to fight it. We have to fight it. We have to explain and to give 
hope to the French people. If not, uh, it can go very, very bad. Well, precisely, uh, some observers say that France is on edge, that a revolution is possible in your country. As, as the former leader of the uh, May 68 uh, student protest, what's your thought on that? No, because they had a uh, sectorial uh, revolt and there is no uh, a common idea. It's true that 20% or 22% could vote or will vote, I don't know, for Marine Le Pen, but you have 80% who are strongly against her. So it doesn't, you know, you, 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 she is not articulating an idea or there in the revolt of common interest. And a revolt, a society revolt, can only be with idea of common interest. Defend of particular interest is not able, you know, to push France to a new uh, revolt. So uh, I think all the, to compare this is nonsense. The French president, François Hollande, uh has hit an all-time low in uh, approval ratings. 21% of the French believe he's a good president. Is he as bad as the French think? Well, the problem of Hollande that he, he doesn't... Uh, he, he doesn't have... Uh, or nobody understands what he wants to do. And I think, I think this is his problem, you know. I, he, he should take a line for a, a, a big, a, a real income tax law reform. To, to really to say, I will reform France profoundly, not with little measures here and there. And then he, ge he goes his way, and then he has a chance, you know. But to change every time... To it's not too late. In politics, it's never too late, because today is a day before tomorrow, and tomorrow you can always do something. Now, I'd like to talk about the uh, possible free trade uh, agreement between Europe and the United States. First, let's watch a report brought to us by uh, Karina Chabour as she finds out in France, producers and business leaders are very divided. These tiny bubbles are known worldwide. They are a sign of age and the result of a tedious grape selection process grown on very specific land. Champagne is a very special type of wine. It's an effervescent wine, but the most important thing is that it comes from the Champagne region in France. The climate here is harsh and the soil is very particular. This winemaker hopes these specific geographic features will soon be recognized by wine producers in the U.S., whom he says use champagne tags on any sparkling wine bottle. We cannot accept the U.S. allowing its wine producers to make sparkling wine by injecting CO2 into the bottles, just like they would in Coca-Cola. If the EU and the U.S. signed the trade agreement, this unfair competition would come to an end. But farmers in other sectors could find themselves disadvantaged by the New Deal. On this mid-sized cattle farm in France, Roger Lanfroy and his son raise about 100 cows. It's a small family business compared to the gigantic American ranches. He says if beef is imported from the U.S., prices will plummet. If they let too much meat enter the European market, prices will go down. But for us, food for the cattle is already very expensive. All expenses are on the rise. While EU and U.S. officials are trying to appease farmers, some are still very skeptical about the prospect of a trade deal. The agreement hasn't been signed yet, so tonight at least, Mr. L'Enfroy's cows can sleep tight. Bonne nuit, mes mères, à demain. Daniel Combedi, the uh, European Commission says that uh, the deal would bring in some 119 billion euros worth of benefits. Do you share this view? I don't know. I think all these figures are bullshit. Nobody knows, you know. So. Uh, well, I think the free trade agreement is a danger. It's a danger because we have social norms, we have ecological norms in Europe, and in the free trade agreement, this will be destroyed. And I think we don't need it. We don't need it. And we have a very good program. You say there was two rounds of negotiation. As a journalist, do you know what they negotiate? No, you don't know. Why? Because the American imposed that no transparency. Nobody knows what they discuss. Nobody knows what is on the table. And I think in a modern democratic time, this is impossible. In time of NSA, you know, it is ridiculous what happened this, and Europe should stop the negotiation to say oh, that these circumstances, we don't do it. And then we will see, you know, 
the, co the, the exchange between Europe and uh, the United States is flourishing. We don't need this free trade argument. The argument that tr liberalization only of the market is the solution of our time, this is not true. Now, you've recently announced that you won't be running in the next uh, uh, European election. You said that you want to focus on your passions. One of them is football. What about this massive victory from Le Bleu this week? You must feel ecstatic. No, it was nice. It was nice. It shows that uh, football is a fantastic game because you never know how, how it will end, you know. And I think it was good for France. Even uh, we will see what happened. And, uh, the, the World Championship in Brazil will be great. I will shoot a, a documentary, I make a road movie, uh, traveling through uh, Brazil during the World Cup, you know, and uh, I'm, 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 I'm happy. And what, what was interesting in this game, everybody thinks football you play with your legs. No, a mm -hmm. lot of things is in the head, you know. If you fear, you lose. The French feared in Kiev and they lost. The Ukraine feared to win in Paris in the last. So you start to win or to lose in your head, not with your foot. As a Franco-German, are you torn apart between Le Bleu and the Mannschaft? No, no, I'm born in France. I, I learned loving football in France, so I'm always for France. <laughs> Patriotic there. Okay. Patriot, yes, I, it's like, you know, you, you like the food where you are born and you like the football where you are born. What do uh, football teams tell about Europe and European countries? Well, the, the, that all the world wants to play in Europe. The majority of the Brazilian team plays in Europe. Europe, Europe is the place where the people like to, to, to play football. So it shows that uh, Europe is attractive. Let's keep it. And for this, we need a stronger European Union. Daniel Cohn-Bendit, I remind our viewers that you are the co-president of the Group of the Greens in the European Parliament. Thank you very much for talking to us. You're welcome. And thank you for watching this edition of Talking Europe. I was at the European Parliament in Strasbourg. It's time to go back to Paris.